guys. Welcome to another episode of Lockdown Learning. And today I'm joined by my partner in crime, uh, senior instructor at the Three Hammers, uh, Mr. Steve Thomas. How are you doing, Steve? I'm good, Rob. Thank you. How are you? Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Bird. Yeah, really looking forward to uh, to getting back. It's been a long old stretch, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Ready to get back now. It's been before Christmas since we did a golf lesson uh, face-to-face. So, uh, yeah, itching to get back. I've bought loads of uh, training aids and, and ready to, to use them on the on unexpected clients you know so <laughs> you've been uh, you've been spending a few quid on train aids haven't you those sounds of things yeah that's what happens when you've got nothing else to do you just you know, <laughs> and, uh, yeah think about all the exciting uh, lessons uh, that we can do with all this new stuff so. good man and you've always liked to train aid stevie haven't you i have i have it's good fun yeah cool uh well uh, today uh, today's series uh, guys uh, we're going to be focusing on something which uh, which both steve and i really feel extremely passionate about and uh, that is developing uh, developing skill from a uh, from a player and looking at uh, at ways of how we can develop the uh, the actual skill set of a player so uh, some skills testing improving kind of methods of practice uh, now today's um, lockdown learning really came about from uh, back in november when uh, steve uh, ray jakeman the golf pt uh, lyle uh, lyle Kirkham from Spark Performance and myself, we delivered a webinar based on developing the modern day golfer. Um, and Steve took us through a fantastic presentation there about uh, practice, different types of practice. Um, and um, it was it's kind of typical what we see from lots of the club golfers is they go and play their golf. Uh, we get handicap data from them. Um, sometimes we get some very simple stats. Um, and we also uh, we also get some block practice reports. So seeing what they've been doing out, out there on the range. Uh, or should we say reports, more like feedback. What's hot, what's not, and generally practicing what they're pr- or, already pretty good at. What uh, an area which has really been missing for us is uh, is skills testing. It's something which uh, elite level players do so well, uh, applying a little bit of pressure to their uh, to their practice and in their performance, uh, which then we can take to the uh, to the golf course. And uh, I think uh, what. Uh, Steve and I, we, we've had several conversations about this, you know, the importance of actually really getting to know uh, our client and really getting to understand what they need to improve. So uh, their perception of, uh, of, of skill or strengths and weaknesses is actually, when we, when we dig a little bit deeper, is quite different to uh, what actually needs to be improved. Would you agree with that, Steve? Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, people don't really know their own games anywhere near as well as they think they do. Uh, and so having, um, yeah, having benchmarks, having, having games that kind of highlights those problems to people, uh, I think is invaluable. Uh, and it's a really great way to actually develop the skill in the games themselves. It's not just a feedback tool for how, how where you're at. It helps you develop uh, those skills in those areas as well. So very important yeah. stuff. I think, um, you know, we were talking about just before we, we started as well, Rob, with skills and, and these games is that this is the real fun fun part of practice for, for when, certainly when i was and as you said when you were when you were uh, practicing to uh, to become pro and what have you this is really fun stuff it's not hard work at all it's not slogging on the range this is uh, this is great this is fun i think when i look back it, it was uh, it was it was kind of skills testing that really uh, really kind of uh, kept me infused and uh, you know really kept me in the game and that it, it was actually having the advice and being set the challenges, which really helped me, you know, and I think without that, you know, practice, let's face it, practice can get pretty, pretty dull and boring, can't it? So, uh, you know, we at the Three Hammers, we're obviously blessed with, uh, with magnificent sort of tis with the smart range and top tracer and track man and, and all of these sort of things. But, you, you know, you don't need this to, you know, to keep practice uh, engaging and, and, and fun and, uh, it's never been easier, is it? It's never been easier to have a fun practice session now with all that tech and no. you, know, you, you know what you're talking about there about you know walking out onto the driving range with cones and and uh, and uh, using the notepads and all the rest of it. You know, it's uh, definitely. Never- I mean, I, I remember the days really well, pacing out yards, just having, having golf balls hit at me and hitting golf balls at other people as well, <laughs> trying to find out how far it's going and yeah, all uh, all good fun. One thing was missing was the crash helmet though. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think maybe the, the idea of a skills test maybe scares people off. Maybe we just call them sk- skills games. Game sounds more fun. Which is yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I, you know, again, from working with, uh, you know, spending a lot of time working with elite level junior golfers, you know, through county squads and stuff like that, you know, uh, when you actually use the term test, you know, that you can kind of see them, they're just thinking, oh, my, 
oh my goodness but uh, yeah games and be creative as well i think a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today is we've we've got uh, ideas of what could work uh, and i think steve uh, steve and myself combined you know, we've literally got so many different games and ideas from all aspects of the uh, of the game so today we've literally just taken a uh, a quick snippet of just just a few um, and I think a lot of it is all about, yeah, think outside the box and see how you can uh, advance whatever whatever game uh, you feel is going to help a certain, per a certain part of your golf game. I actually uh, compiled, um, without you knowing, actually, some of the games that you and I have used over the last few years. And I think I'm up to about 200 pages on Word Long. So okay. uh, it's it's it, there are so many games. There's uh, it's, it's incredible just how creative you can be. And many of these are probably just what we've thought off the top of our heads and and, uh, and, and gone with, and it's just worked out really well. So, um, yeah, loads out there. Cool. So um, we've put together a, a few, uh, as I say, a, a few of our, uh, a, a few, I wouldn't say necessarily our favourites, but uh, just, just, just a few ga uh, games here just, just to go through. Uh, and uh, so you've got a, a screen um, a presentation there, haven't you, Steve? So I do, I do. I will bring that up for us. Steve, he loves a presentation. <laughs> Cool. Okay. Excellent. So here we go. So this is the, yeah, the start of our, our presentation. Um, yeah, this is just a bit of a reflection on our, our modern day golfer um, webinar that we did uh, a few months back, uh, just to show again some of the key areas that need to uh, be considered when developing uh, a, a player um, and we've highlighted as you can see here skill development which is what we're going to be focusing on a little bit here but I think you know we could we could have easily like we said you know we could have highlighted fun and engaging as well we could have highlighted practice and we could have highlighted time I think as well because I think when you make fun, when you make your, 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 your practice more fun and you're developing skill you're actually using that time more efficiently too so there's lots of things that uh, there's many, many um, squares here that we could have highlighted for today's presentation. Um, so, uh, yeah. 100 as well. Looking at looking at strategy there and competition as uh, as well. You know, literally, it ticks so many boxes, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Steve, you carry on. Yeah, I was going to say, like competition-wise, I mean, you know, you do these with a friend, and it's, you know, you can. Uh, the, the winner of the game, the, the loser has to, you know, buy the sandwich in the bar afterwards or something like this. You know, it's uh, there's so many things you can do, and I think that competition element is really important because when you go onto a golf course, you're in competition. Your mindset is slightly different to when you're just on a practice ground, mm -hmm. um, you know, doing these games. But I think that's sort of uh, in, you do it in stages. So first of all, you just want to get into the habit of doing these games, logging your progress, you know, developing sort of these these finer skills and then starting to do it under stress and, and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But I think that competition one, like you say, they're Rob, super important. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, having, having that element of consequences uh, is absolutely key, isn't it? You know, it's, it's very, you know, people will, will practice on a range and, um, or, or their practice area and they, 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 it doesn't really matter where the golf ball's going, you know, but yeah. when we actually set ourselves a task to, uh, to, you know, to, to try and achieve and, and as you touched on there, practicing with a friend, I think, is crucial. Looking back at my earlier uh, earlier days, there, you know, practicing with, uh, with you know with my pals there was uh, was absolutely for me was just so powerful. I think it you know really helped me massively. And I'm very comp I'm a very competitive person. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> I was out there literally from uh, from you know dusk till uh, well dawn dawn till dusk. Yeah, um, yeah. Just uh, trying, just against it, whether it's whether it's you know, sh lots of short game practice, putting skills, lot, lots of things like that. But from from this webinar here, I mean, with Ray and um, and Lyle as well, uh, you presented, um, you know, delivered a fantastic presentation there on different types of practice. Uh, Lyle too followed that up there with um, you know the the actual uh, the, the psychological side of the game, which is which is huge. Um, and Ray then with the strength and conditioning side of the game, and uh, the webinar itself was. Uh, was so full of content, and I think you know the skills development one was uh, we discussed. You know, we touched on it literally for seconds, didn't we? So I think yeah. it really uh, it deserves a whole placement in uh, in this series. Absolutely, yeah. And if I if I'll just add one more thing to to competition, I think um, it's very important to have the right culture at your golf club to to make sure that that competition's there. So, for example, at the Three Hammers, you know, we have uh, hundreds of people in our junior section. 
And so that creates a, a culture where you, people are friends, uh, they're, they're playing golf together, there's going to be that natural competition. And it, everybody kind of helps each other get better, not, not, not necessarily directly, just through, um, you know, the, that environment of being able to uh, have other people force you to get the best out of yourself uh, and make it more enjoyable as well that culture part of, of where you're practicing. You know, if you're at a golf club where you never see anybody there, you're the only person ever on the driving range, that person, you know, isn't going to improve as much mm -hmm. as somebody at a golf club where he's got 20 of his mates around him and they're all having a bit of fun and laugh about who can hit a low punch under that tree, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think yeah, cool. important. Cho choosing where you play your golf, uh, make sure it's the right fit for you. Absolutely. Important. Um, right. Let's uh, let's go to our our first our first game that Rob and I've uh, 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 thought to, to share with you guys. So it's called uh, putting uh, the putting star. So we've gone three foot, six foot, and nine foot stars. So that's what it looks like uh, to have laid out. And the way that we lay this out here is that we've got five tee pegs um, around a hole, and uh, it can you can have a slope on it maybe to start off with something fairly flat, but you can have a, have a slope when you do this. It helps to to practice all different types of slope when, you do it, when you're doing it. And you're going to either have these tee pegs either three foot, six foot, or nine foot away from the hole. And the, uh, the idea here is, is that you're going to go around uh, hitting the putts into the, uh, in, into the hole uh, until you miss. And you're counting how many consecutive putts you can make. Um, and then you record that. And, uh, and that can be then a benchmark for you to see whether you're improving um, and, uh, and how and where, where you might need to practice. You might be quite good at three foot putts, but really poor at nine foot putts, uh, for example. And then you know to practice your nine foot putts perhaps a little bit more as well. Um, Rob, you had a couple of statistics from the, the, from the tour uh, to try to get some idea for our clients here how important this area of the game is. Yeah, yeah, I think um, yeah, this this one here is probably looks quite familiar to uh, to to many of us. It's uh, it's very much uh, the uh, tried and tested skills test. This and um, you know, most people can do this on the uh, the, the putting green at the the local club. Um, now, I think too many golfers, too many club golfers, think that uh, the, the tour players literally hold a lot more putts than they than, than they actually do. So the actual uh, the actual figure is fifty uh, percent. Is it fifty uh, percent of them will hold? Um, sorry, tour pros will hold seven uh, seven foot ten inch putts fifty percent of the time. That's the actual uh, that's the actual limit. So anything over and above seven, so eight feet and above, they will uh, they will they will miss more. Well, they'll miss more than they'll hold. So anything from kind of within that uh, that's that seven foot ten range there is, is 50 the actual current stat there is based at 50 percent so many of us now who watch the uh, watch the golf on uh, on on tv the us and the european tour will quite often be looking at that strokes gained stat so uh, without going into too much depth about st strokes gained if a player is uh, now this is that point there on the greens if a player was to make a putt from seven foot ten and above they would be gaining strokes on the rest of the field if a player was to miss a putt from seven foot ten inches and above, they would be losing strokes on the uh, the rest of the field. And if a player was to miss a putt, putt within that range, they're going to lose lose some serious strokes on the rest of the field. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, with this game here, you know, a nice easier way to to sort of introduce yourself to it is, uh, as you can see here, I've allowed you to have a single life. So when you're sort of just getting to the grips with the idea of just starting out with it, just giving yourself a life, just so that you can get some, um, it just makes it a little bit less stressful. Um, you know, you're not panicking over the ball, um, but you're soon gonna get over that and get more comfortable in those situations, which is only gonna help and serve your golf out on the golf course. So if you're really good at putting and holding three foot putts, you know, if you hold a hundred three foot putts just before you go out and play, you're gonna feel pretty comfortable over a three foot putt when you're out there. Uh, and as things get a bit more advanced, um, you know, obviously what you're trying to do is you're trying to break your record here. So, um, you know, try to break the, the 20, 30, 50 putt barriers uh, and try to do that for, for three, six and nine feet as well. Of course, you could go further back, but the idea of this is that you're put, you are trying to focus on that area, which Rob's talking about there, about, you know, it really inside 10 feet, that is where um, the best players in the world are holding a lot of their putts. Um, you know, 50% plus, uh, you know, inside 
inside seven uh, seven foot ten inches so yeah classic drill uh, i think we've all done this kind of stuff but it's easy to forget that this kind of thing is uh, very important I think as well, with, if I can just jump in uh, with this one, guys, we see uh, it's really important to uh, get yourself set up on, on a putting green from, say, your, your three to five feet range on a straight putt, using your train aids, so whether you're using with putting strings, whether you're using alignment sticks uh, or mirrors, uh, really important to work on those fundamentals, but then take everything away then and, and, and test yourself on this. You know, lots of the players who I'm working with now, as we're approaching the, uh, the uh, operation restart there, you know, we're trying to, we've gone through the, the ugly zone practice, swing change, all that sort of stuff. But I'm doing, trying to do as much skills tennis testing as possible now with players. Uh, I've got players putting in their living rooms now, working on start gates, which they've just set up with golf balls. Uh, but it's really important we go through the actual fundamental work and then test yourself. And uh, as Steve said there um, about playing with a little bit of slope there, I think is absolutely crucial because we'll all have our favoured right to left or left to right or straight putts and it's interesting then as you start uh, as you start really digging a little bit deeper here you'll start seeing little patterns occurring here when you're missing where you're missing yeah absolutely and uh, I, I actually used to do a, a slightly harder version as well when I was uh, when I was practicing a lot more I would put a, a tee peg um, a foot past the hole uh, on the uh, it was it was it was on all of them, but mainly on the long, slightly longer putts here. And if the ball, if I, when I missed the putt, if it went past the tee peg, I would subtract ten shots off the, the score I just had. So it really, I really it started to emphasize there just the dead weight of the putt. Okay. Um, and when you're when you're trying to putt the ball dead weight, the hole actually plays a lot bigger. Um, so if you've got if the ball's traveling at speed toward the hole. Um, it really needs to be dead center to go in um, because it kind of just gets flung out with that momentum of the ball. Yeah. So it really just helps you train the sort of dead weight just so that the, you're using the maximum width of the hole as well. And it's just a little incentive, it's a little just to make sure that I'm keeping my eye on making, you know, not, not ramming it into the hole, which is easy to do when you're standing over three foot, six foot putts for, for an hour and you're just holding one after another. It's just really easy just to kind of get into a, relaxed frame of mind and you kind of then you miss that putt and it goes four foot past and you go oh um yeah, with uh, with that one steve uh, one which uh, has really been popular obviously with myself and a number of my players as well is the from the, the three foot range what i'd work on a lot with a player i'd actually insert a t-peg into the back of the hole yeah. so it's something you know it's like the uh, the backboard analogy there in, in basketball there so uh, the player then's focus is not on the actual hole it's the hole of the hole itself is that t-peg yeah. So hitting that tee peg as well helps with the helps with the pace. What you're saying there about your speed is again is massively uh, overlooked by many many players. Uh, there's a lot of research uh, that's gone into the perfect speed for that golf ball to go in the hole, um, and uh, uh, it's around about that kind of 10 inch past number. So if a putt is traveling 10 inches past the uh, past the hole, that's pretty much that's that that's pretty that's perfect pace there for the hole then to uh, to swallow that swallow that golf ball up anything quicker than that if it was going to hit the edge of the hole it's going to lip out generally what we see if putts are slower than that certainly as we move to kind of the six nine foot range as well putts that are traveling dead way to a slow they actually tend to bobble offline that little bit and they will take a little bit more break yeah yeah perfect uh, should we move on to the next game yeah cool yeah yeah let's go cool. right so the next one uh putts golf isn't fair uh, isn't it just uh, so this one yeah it's a putting game again um but what we're doing here we're we're choosing a random hole um the distance is going to vary slightly we want to do sort of 20 25 30 25 and 40 feet so that's five different locations that you're going to start from um and what you're going to what you want to be from different lines so you don't want to have it going from the same place but having the same sort of break and you want a different parts of the green that you're coming towards the hole and the idea here is that you try to get the ball into the hole in the fewest amount of shots through this kind of this uh, five hole golf course, if you like. So uh, the only downside here is, is that if you miss a putt, you have to then draw it back a putter length, which is around about three foot. So you can see the chap here on this, uh, this right hand side. He's hit the ball to a couple of feet from the hole and now he's drawing it back a club length and then he has to make his putt from there. So his, his goal here is to, like I said, to try to get it as few shots as possible. Obviously with five holes, the best score you could possibly do is five. 
Um, and uh, I think what we're doing here is, is that we're always adding that little um, element of, uh, I, for me, it was always a little bit of element of pressure because you're making everything just that much harder. Um, and I think uh, it's a really good, uh, I think it's a really good game for, for different lengths and different, uh, uh, different directions into the hole as well. Um, to make it easier, obviously, you could play from a little bit closer. So you've got 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 feet away. Making it harder, you could play from further away from the hole, but also you could do two club lengths back instead of just the one as well. So I think, uh, yeah, Rob, any thoughts? Yeah, I love this game, Steve. Uh, this is one which I do an awful lot with players. Um, one of the uh, one of the ways which we could actually make this a little bit easier, guys, as, as well, is uh, if you're that golfer who's uh, constantly leaving a putt short of the hole, uh, we could actually, to try and make that a little bit more aggressive, is if you, so let's see if you go through uh, Steve's initial setup here, 20 foot, 25 foot, 30 and 35, 40. Uh, if you leave that first putt short, you then must withdraw it back a putt of length. But if you get the putt past the front edge of the hole, you can then play it out from there. So uh, we can, uh, I think Steve's games here is great because he's really going to get you to practice those, uh, those putt of length uh, putts, those three foot putts. But uh, yeah, if, to try and encourage you to get the ball to the hole, that can be the consequence. If you leave it short, you withdraw. Uh, and a way of which we can take that to the golf course as well. So uh, many of us, we have lots of, uh, leisure time, you know, practice rounds of golf, whether it's at a home club or away from home. Uh, so to add a little bit of consequence to that, those practice rounds, if you leave a putt short, bring it back a putter length, yeah, and play it, play it from there. See what you score. Did it? Does it actually help you become a more positive putter? Uh, again, that's just uh, th th these are just thoughts again, which which I've worked on with players over, over the years. You know, it's not. Uh, Golf isn't rocket science and setting up games like this, you know, we can do whatever we want and make it as tough, as easy as, you know, as we like there. Just be, you know, just show a little bit of imagination there and, uh, and yeah, get, make it competitive. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think um, if I remember this uh, right, the, I think it's a tall stat here, but um, I think it's at, at 32 feet is the point where um, three putts start to become I think is the, is the point where you're just as likely to three putt as you are to two putt. As you are two putt, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know, when we're doing this kind of game, that's really sort of testing those skills when perhaps we're right on the edge of the, the, the point where three putts are possible and then to draw it back away from the hole again, like we've hit a really poor putt and test those skills to make sure in those key moments that we don't just drop a shot there. Mm -hmm. I think it really helps to, uh, to, to support that. I think going back as well, Steve, you know, to the uh, to the point was making about perfect pace. Uh, certainly, these distances here, I see so many golfers uh, focusing so much on line. When really, if we were to uh, to shift that 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 focus towards pace of putt, the actual pace of putt uh, will actually determine the line as well. So, if you're focusing, if you're really feeling that putt, say ten inches past the hole, that's going to really help with the line there. Quite often, we focus on line and we forget about pace. Yeah. I think that pay, what you're saying there, Rob, is, 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 is the number one reason why people see three putts. Um, yeah. isn't it? You know, it's, it's pace. And, you know, I've, I've never seen anybody hit a, hit a putt 30 feet or tw 20 feet to the, to the left or right of a, of a hole, but I've seen them leave 20 foot. Yeah. Short. I think uh, as well, uh, just uh, I feel quite strongly about this. One, one of the, uh, <laughs> look at the, uh, the, the top players. Uh, so a, a name which literally jumps out, who's doing particularly well lately as well, Jordan Spieth. Um, you know, he holds a crazy amount somewhere when he's really uh, Jordan Spieth was winning these majors. He was he holds a crazy amount of putts from uh, from long range. Now, um, it wouldn't it, Jordan Spieth's pace is unreal. Um, and just as well as the, the top players will strike the golf ball off the tee and with their approach, uh, the guy, the top players strike the putts so well. So the importance there of finding the center of that putter face is absolutely crucial. So uh, if you drop Steve or myself a message there, we've got a whole host of drills and tips for you there to uh, to help with your uh, to improve your putter striking absolutely um so this is just we're talking about, we're talking about three putts and putting here we've got some statistics that are kind of average statistics so you know you, you know they, they are useful to a point obviously um you know we've got handicaps down the, down the left side and then you know we can see here the sort of the, the three putt percentage that people experience average on on uh, per round and you can see obviously a huge drop off when you start to go towards the, the pro golfer down here. 
you know, much more, much more emphasis here on the putter, uh, the, the speed of the putt, uh, and the mistakes made up here are going to be because of that, because of that speed of putt. We can see total putts average, how much that comes down as the handicaps lower as well. Um, you know, literally, you know, the difference between here, like a one handicap and a zero handicap, is like the putting. <laughs> you know, yeah, so. definitely. Um, I think as well, Steve, at this, this point you're making there, it's a really interesting point because we can see uh, such a difference there with, with the total puts. But take a look at the uh, the greens in regulation because people will probably look at that and say, yeah, well, they're pros. You know, they're, they're supposed to, uh, you know, plus four golfers supposed to uh, take less puts. But if you're hitting more yeah. greens in regulation, you're going to be having some lengthy puts. You know, if you're hitting less greens in regulation, <laughs> one would think you should be chipping it a little bit closer to the hole. So uh, in theory there, if you're hitting less greens, you should be taking less puts. But uh, that's what makes these, uh, you know, the, the lower handicappers uh, so good is because they're hitting the greens, but also their their strike, they're fundamentally sound on the green, striking the putts so well and really working out their pace control so well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. Okay, let's go to back to the presentation. I think we may jump back on that on the uh, a few times and there's some interesting chipping yeah. stats there, which we'll have a look at now, aren't we, sir? So. Absolutely. Okay. So next game, unless you add anything more to, to add to the last last game, Rob? No, it's cool. I love that. Golf definitely isn't fair. It's fun. Uh, it's frustrating. Uh, it isn't fair. But no, I, I love this. One of my faves. Okay, so next one we got uh, landing zones. Um, another another classic game that um, we play. I've played this hundreds and hundreds of times. Uh, so what we're going to be doing here, um, I use T-Pegs. Um, you know, so the, the game setup that we've got here is a standard game. You know, you're going to put a tee peg down where you're going to hit the ball from, about 10 foot off the front uh, or, or side of the green. Um, then you're going to mark a peg down in the ground about 10 foot onto the green and then have consecutively, you know, a three foot further away, have another tee peg and do that so that you've got you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven um, in a row. And that then creates six zones for us that we have here. And I then make a, a six foot wide zone uh, to start off with and then have the tee pegs on the other side just parallel to the tee pegs that we started off with to begin with. So it kind of creates this like boxed area between these four tee pegs, so each one here. So I've marked it one, two, three, four, five, and six here as we go up. Um, so the idea here is that you're going to try to land the ball in, in the zone. Um, so the way that I sort of start to do this is I'll go from uh, the nearest one to the furthest one, then I'll go from the furthest back down to the nearest, and then I'll start doing random ones. So I'll have to call it. I'm going to go to the bottom, uh, zone number three, zone number six, zone number five, zone number two, just so that I don't sort of get dialed in with the feeling. And so, yeah, you're looking to land the ball in the zone. So one of the problems that I often see when, uh, when teaching clients is, is that they're looking at the hole a lot and they're using just the, the how far back away from the hole they are to, to determine how hard they need to hit the putt or hit the hit the chip sorry the, the the trouble is of course is that there could be a there could be a bank in the way there could be uh there could be a lot of rough in the way um or, or fairway in the way the ball's going to come out of that very differently um you might have uh, different clubs in your hands there might be some wind which really you know, which really affects chipping as well so i think that you need to be sort of looking at where do i want the ball to land and then predicting how it's going to roll out and that way your instinct for chipping becomes a lot more sophisticated um and i think you start to to see the, the little details in slopes and how is the ball going to come out of that grass there and i think then you can get a higher level of precision uh, i don't know if you've experienced that kind of stuff rob Definitely, uh, I think the, the key here is is land, isn't it? Landing zone, uh, not not finish, not run, not. Uh, uh, again, as we're uh, just moving towards the end of uh, lockdown, and this this is something which we can uh, we can all do in the garden uh, as well. You know, certainly, golfers need to uh, get a better understanding of where they're landing the golf ball, because um, typically when um, it's kind of my personal pet hate, if uh, if I'm honest with you, of a uh, working with a, a club golfer uh, when they've got their favorite wedge around the green. Um, they'll focus on ball, they'll focus on target, and they're kind of missing that kind of the all important landing area. When we see the, uh, the 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 top players who are really clinical around the green, scrambling stats, getting up and down is crucial. They're going to look at the um, the lie, 
how the golf ball's lying. They're going to look at where they want to be landing the golf ball. So not on, not in the face of a slope or anything like that. Uh, where's a smart area to land the golf ball? Typically, we want to get the ball on the green as quick as possible, Steve, yeah? Yep. Um, and then what loft do we need, guys? So lie, land, loft. This exercise here is absolutely brilliant there to focus on you know, exactly that. And Steve touched on there, and it, uh, with, it's in the description of you know using all your clubs as well with this. So uh, start off with your favorite chipping club, whether it's a pitching wedge or a sand iron, which is generally uh, the majority of players' favorites. Uh, but then test yourself, you know, eight iron, nine iron, seven iron, six irons, hybrids even, just seeing can we get that golf ball landing in that uh, in that zone? Yeah, exactly. So the, the game that we've got here, in the very simplest version, um, we've got the six zones, and you're going to try to land it in each of the six zones. Um, and so, so the best score you can get is six, um, but obviously the lower you can get, uh, the better. So if you miss one, you would um, you would you would try to get it on the next shot. And obviously, if it takes uh, a few shots to get into a particular zone, then that's going to have a, a bigger score in the end, and you'll then have an idea of how good your chipping is. But you'll also have an idea of the kind of length of chip that you maybe struggle with a bit more. Is it the the twenty to twenty three foot chip, or is it or is it the longer ones towards the back? You know, is it the, the, the zone six or is it zone one that you're struggling a bit? You can also vary this a little bit. So rather than being ten foot off the edge, you could have it 20, 30, 40 feet, whatever it might be off the edge. Uh, of the uh, of the green, so just to just to test different areas of it. So that means that it could transform into like a, a pitching landing zone game as well. And of course, you could um, you could make the zone six feet long instead of three feet long uh, if you're starting to get a bit further back, or if you want to make it, the game a little bit easier. Um, uh, yeah, to make it to make it harder, of course, you know, narrow it. Don't make it six foot wide anymore. Have a bit more emphasis on direction as well as, as well as the distance, which is the primary focus of it as well. And you know, I think I think you know, just going a little bit again on what Rob's saying about the you know, the, the landing zone here, the visualization of where you want it to land is 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 so huge. So I I actually in my chipping I've done this kind of game to the point where when I chip, I actually visualize a box that I'm trying to la land the ball in. Um, and I can see the flight and I can see how it's landing into the box, but this image is so vivid in my mind, I actually, the, I, the color of my box is a dark red. So I know I can, I, it sounds a bit silly, but I, I just, I have, I don't even have to think about it. If that's just what I see and I move my, it's a rectangle in my mind because if you were to view it from bird's eye view, it'd be a square. So it's a red rectangle. And I just move it around the green and I'm thinking, right, if I land it there with that kind of trajectory, how's that going to roll out? And so this kind of game really helped me in becoming, I think chipping is probably my strength as a, as, a, as a golf professional in terms of my own game. And I think that kind of, um, this game in particular, really, really developed my understanding of where to land the ball. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if uh, many people have red rectangles in their mind, but I certainly use it very well. I urge, uh, I, you know, with, with that in mind, guys, you know, we generally when we're hitting a chip shot, if we're on a practice, if we're practicing, we've got a set of golf clubs next to us. So as Steve's saying there, why not pick your landing area, uh, then take four clubs out of your golf bag, four irons, long irons, and then create that box yourself. Uh, drop three balls down. See how many times you actually pitch that golf ball in that in that box. Yeah, that's uh great test and yeah you can do say do that at home in the uh, in the garden but uh, really really uh, i think the uh, the number one player for me which, which springs to mind there uh, would be sevi yeah you know i can still see it now you know sevi's eyes you know around the greens as he's kind of prowling he's figuring everything out there it's all feel 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 sees that landing area great red box analogy there stevie i love that I'm not sure how many people have uh, have ever shared their red box. <laughs> <laughs> you never told me about that red box. <laughs> but yeah, just just in my mind. So yeah, I think if the box comes from you know, having tea pegs and having golf clubs on the ground in a box. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Should we move on. Cool. Yeah, just just before uh, just before we do move on uh, with that, I mean, tea pegs, uh, tea pegs, great, and tea pegs work wonders there actually on the green at, at a golf club. But uh, if you're doing the, any any kind of garden golf there, just lay down uh, a series of golf clubs. So uh, I would generally pace out. I've actually just done a video on this not, not long ago. So I would pace out two paces, put a club shaft down, 
Uh, again, two paces, put a club shaft down, two paces, put a club shaft down. Uh, that way, and again, just ways we can really visualize those, the, those landing areas. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I just thought I'd bring up these stats again, just so we can have a look at some of the chipping and uh, some pitching side of it. Yeah, I think you can see quite a dramatic improvement in chipping amongst uh, single figure handicaps. Um, you know, you start to get 50-50 uh, uh, in your chipping up and down. Um, but as soon as you start getting into sort of, yeah, here it's got it around about the sort single of- Single figures, yeah. Up. Yeah. Um, you know, anything above that really, it's dropping off hugely. So that means that there's more pressure on the rest of your game. If you, if you can't get up and down from missing the green, that means you've got to hit the green every time to make a good score. Yeah. Uh, whereas a good player won't really, won't, well, they'll be a bit, maybe a bit upset, but they're not going to, it's not the end of the world if they miss the green because they can get up and down and save par. And, um, it takes the pressure off that, uh, that approach play or what, what have you. So, Take a look at that stat there, Steve, from uh, from an 18 handicapper, uh, what well, we're looking 27% of the time, down to a scratch handicapper there, 75%, you know, you're 50% there, haven't you? Yeah, incredible, isn't it? Such a big difference. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, as a, an area under practice, um, I think probably one of the more, more fun areas that a player could practice, and we can see here the evidence that if you're good at it, the chances are you've got a better handicap. So. Yeah. Definitely. Makes perfect sense. Okay. Okay. So now we've got um, our approach play. So we're a bit further away from the greens now. Um, so this is usually done on a sort of driving range. Um, these days you can use uh, like radars and we have top tracer and we have track man at the, the three hammers um but um you know rob was saying earlier on again about you know pacing it out with uh, with um with cones and, and what have you as well so it can be done if you don't have access to that but if you're uh, with us at the three hammers then obviously you can use the top tracing system for this kind of thing and uh, the idea here <coughs> is um that uh well, we've got some different, we've got some yardages that I've set out here. So we've got 120, 130, 140, 150, and 160. So that's kind of our ladder. And we've got to try to get the ball to land within a certain percentage distance of the, the named yard. So, for example, that we've got the 120 yards there. Um, so you've got to try to get it within 5% to be able to progress to the 130. If you get it within 10%, you stay where you are. And if you get it within uh, or to, uh, outside of that 10% distance, you would either go back or if you're at the 120, you have to stay there because that's the bottom of the ladder. Um, so once you've got it within that 5%, you move to 130, you try to do exactly the same thing there. Um, so obviously, you know, 130, you've got to get it within 13 yards uh, of the hole to stay there. Uh, and you've got to get it, you know, within seven yards, let's say, of uh, of that 130 in order to progress to 140. I hope I'm active. Um, and then once you've completed, you, you complete this game by by getting it within five percent of 160. Okay. <clears throat> and so what you're doing here is you're counting how, oh, sorry, you're counting how many shots it takes for you to get to the uh, the 160 yardage. Variations on this, obviously, you can start at different yardages. So 50 yards, um, you can start there and work more on the short game. Uh, you can start at 150 and go all the way up, um, you know, over 200 yards and work more on the long game as well. So um, that's uh, that's uh, for me. This is great because you're, you're you've got something quite specific in your mind that you're trying to practice. You're not just shelling out onto the driving range. Uh, with obviously the emphasis here on, on distance. Uh, you can make this game easier by uh, changing the percentages. So rather than 5 and 10%, it could be uh, 10 and 15%, for example. You can make this uh, harder uh, by having more yardages to go through. So maybe the five yards uh, between the different yardages. So you've got, one, uh, you've got 120, 125, 130, 135, etc. So that you've got more steps on the ladder to be able to complete the game. Um, so uh, I, I think it's good also to, if you get, um, get when, when you make the game harder and you've got quite a narrow um, area, you can sometimes try to hit, let's say you do 120, 125, 130, 135 as your ladder. 
can you do that with all with just one golf club? Can you can you do that with just a, a, a nine iron, for example? And then you start to to learn a little bit more skill in terms of okay, how how do I need to move my body? What kind of effort speed do I need to put into the ball? Um, you know, measuring the the conditions that you're in to become more acute uh, in terms of uh, yeah, being able to control your ball a bit more as well. So that's a bit harder, but you, there's a lot of flexibility with this kind of game. Uh, anything you would like to add, Rob? No, I think this really follows on again from what we're saying about the uh, the chipping and uh, the approach play. So what we're actually looking at here uh, is uh, is carry distance, Stevia. Yeah. yeah. So uh, again, from many many golfers, they're looking at total to total distance, total distance, total distance. So total distance depends on a whole host of factors: wind, uh, how how firm or soft the uh, the actual ground is. But when we can get a real good understanding of how far our golf ball is going through the air. Uh, then uh, it's your game management there to actually figure out your, your, your total rollout. So that's really important for this. We're really looking at actual carry distance. One thing which uh, Steve and I do um, do a lot with players is uh, is trackman testing. You know, on on, uh, on the trackman uh, radar there, we do um, what we call a combine test, which give, gives a player a score based on how far they're hitting the golf ball or, or hitting the golf ball a certain distance. So. Checking out random distances here is uh, is really important. And again, ways to advance this uh, to try and keep it a little bit easier. You know, don't really focus any, don't really focus uh, too much on direction here, um, but to make it a little bit a uh, little bit tougher there. Give yourself actual actual channels there to uh, to be able to score from. So, for example, if we land at one eighteen uh, on the, the one twenty yardage, but if we're if we're twenty yards offline, you know, can you really uh, progress to the next distance? I'll leave that up to you there to uh, to to figure it out. And you can uh, there's so many different levels that we can we can put into this. And uh, and you know, as as Steve said, there we do we start um, do we, you know, we can start much shorter distances for players who will struggle to hit these distances. And I really love what we're saying there, Steve, about your actual um, varying the golf clubs, but also seeing if you can achieve this with just just the one club. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I think that that just gives that little bit more sort of. Uh, it takes you out of that sort of um, that quite rigid sort of mindset, perhaps, of just this club goes this far, this club goes this far, and it doesn't quite, you know, it doesn't really work like that. Um, you can you need that number, but you need to be able to be flexible. You know, the 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 chances of that number actually coming up on the golf course are not that high, so you do need to be a little bit flexible with how you can, you know, uh, hit a shot. You know, you should be able to take a little bit off it. You should be able to put a bit more on it. Of course, that's a bit more advanced, but that's that's where this drill could take you if you were to, to become you know, pretty good at it. You know, you can, yeah. you can make it harder and, and develop your skill. So it works. Uh, it works well. I think as well. Another point with with all of these skills tests, and when you're playing the um, you you golf guys, uh, what's what what I feel is so um, so important there is to is to reflect upon your round of golf, reflect upon your practice session. Reflect upon your uh, your ladder slip here. You know what did you uh, what did you score? How did you find it? What would you do different next time? What would be your challenge next time as well? Because when you've done it, you know it's uh, it's fresh in the mind. Um, you've still got the feels. Um, what we're gonna when we're gonna do this next time? And again, you know, from working with a number of players just recently and spend a lot of time uh, on Zoom calls. Set you know now is the time to uh, to to set you know, to try and make it that little bit more competitive. Uh, but please reflect upon uh, our our experience and, uh, and and plan plan for next time. Test yourself. Absolutely. Uh, so yep, <clears throat> going uh, going now into the greens in regulation uh, sort of section of it here, and um, you know we can see again a a big improvement in greens and regulation uh, as we as the handicaps get better. I think the the one thing that surprised me. When I was uh, an amateur and, and learning some of these numbers, is my perception of some of these great players is you know you need to be hitting 80% greens in regulation to be any good. And uh, you can see here plus four is um, a very serious golfer. Uh, that would be a, a touring professional, perhaps not at the highest level, but certainly certainly a very 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 good golfer. You know 70%. But what we see, I think, a lot on the, the, the on the TV, you know, when we're watching these events, seventy percent greens in regulation often win the event. Um, so, you know, by my mind, you know, eighty percent 
75%, you know, I remember being really cross with myself one time for being 75% greens and reg. And obviously that's uh, unrealistic um, to, to every now and again, you're going to, you're going to get better than that, of course, but to average it, um, you know, I think if you're getting, uh, you know, 60% of your greens and reg, I think you're, you're probably, you're going to have a decent round. Um, but we can see here that, you know, the improvement in this approach play is is so it's so important for when trying to bring that because uh, you're bringing your handicap down just because you're going to give yourself more par putts you're going to give yourself more birdie opportunities um so being able to put the ball on the green is um is a, is a good uh, is a good good girl it's really interesting looking looking at those stats as well steve you know the uh, to hit more greens and regulation generally speaking there uh, we need to we you think we need to hit more fairways but one of the uh the few, well, one of the minor differences we've got there is the actual percentage of fairways hit. Yeah. There from your, your elite level, you know, you know, closer scratch player to your, uh, so you look at that 18 handicapper there hits 51% fairways, scratch handicapper there hits 58% one, one, fairways. One thing to bear in mind, as you, I, I know you know with this as well, Rob, is just that obviously as the distance increases, uh, you can see getting narrower. Players, yeah, as, as those better players are, are hitting the ball further to actually maintain the same accuracy in reality means that you have to be more accurate if that makes sense yeah. um but yeah in terms of like actual fairways and regulations it doesn't really doesn't really improve that much mm -hmm. i think, I think uh, interesting, Greece, interesting one there uh, a, a story from i think it was my second ever professional event um back in you know, back in the day uh, i remember playing a tournament and i hit I think it's the first time I ever did it as well. And it just so happened to be in my second event. I hit 100% uh, greens in regulation uh, and I shot level par. I came off that golf course, shot level par. My playing partner at the time, uh, who was a uh, very uh, well-respected um, Midland region player, hit 12 fairways in, uh, sorry, 12 greens in regulation. And I think he shot, was it four, four, three or four, four under par. Okay. So uh, that for me, that was just a just a huge lesson learned. There. <laughs> eighteen fairways, level eighteen fairways. So eighteen greens, thirty six putts, level par score. Yeah, and uh, yeah, losing by four. So it's not, <laughs> all, but not not all about hitting those uh, hitting those greens. I think you know the you know if someone said to me what is the most important stat of, of all of these, I would say um, I would say the scrambling. Yeah. The ability to get it up and down. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think so. I think that's we're seeing such a, a high increase here in, in from 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 higher handicap players to lower handicap players, and those stats in the chipping such a dramatic increase. <clears throat> I think it'd be hard to look past past that. I think um, I think uh, obviously with putting as well. You know, we can we do see some improvement in putting there too. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly, when you consider that that the better player is hitting more greens and still having fewer putts. So I think you're right in that it's not in the short game area, the chipping, and for me as well, I think a bit of putting in there, mm -hmm. that's got to be, uh, that's got to be where a lot of this practice is going to be at. Um, anything to add on the presentation again there, Rob? Or? I don't think so. No, I think that as we can see there, that's just, uh, yeah, we've, we've just cherry picked just, just a few there just to give an idea of, uh, of what we could, you know, what what can be done. But as I said, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of these games that we uh, that we can implement into our practice. Uh, obviously, Steve's. Uh, I touched on this. Um, I can maybe I didn't want to steal your thunder here, but uh, Steve uh, is always look at this. Is uh, is on the ball. We've got the skills game report sheet. So uh, I think reflection is key. Uh, keeping score is uh, is is no is absolutely uh, is vital uh, and again you know it helps us plan for uh, plan for next time as well so yeah I, I, don't, I don't see i've got to be honest with you I, I don't see anywhere near enough players actually completing stats simple game stats and simple scores on themselves uh, as we should from spending time um, abroad uh, certainly seeing club golfers uh, um, out, out in Europe, they would be, you know, they they're forever keeping uh, keeping information like this. And I don't know if it's, I, I don't know, but I don't see enough of it. I'd like to see a little bit more if uh, if I was being critical. Yeah, exactly. I think um, you know if you know you and I both kept this kind of information when we were when we were practicing a lot, Rob. And it, it would be without keeping it, it's like starting again every day. I mean, you've got nothing to to, to beat, no, no sort of goals to try to improve on, um, and you're not learning as well because you're going to forget it. You know, as soon as you walk, you know, go home and you watch a bit of football, have a bit of dinner, you've kind of forgotten a little bit about what that thought was or what 
what you were trying to practice. So just writing it down, a quick scan of it the next morning when you're back out practicing again. And, and you can pick up from where you left off pretty easily. Um, and I, th I think, um, yeah, I mean, I used to keep a, just a piece of paper, like a notepad in my bag. And I practiced and just every day had a new piece of paper and went from there. Yeah, I was yeah, I was very very similar. I think nowadays, I say we were uh, we are spoiled. We've got all these smart ranges, we got smartphones, we got smart everything, and uh, you know, but but we're not getting information. Yeah, popping you know, there's, there's so many apps as well. Perhaps because there is so much choice out there uh, now, and there's, uh, there's 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 too many there's too many distractions. Yeah, uh, but no, I yeah, going back to the uh, you know to the, to the main point of uh, of today. You know, I think developing skill is uh, is absolutely crucial. Find out what you're uh, what you're good at find out what needs work. Uh, Steve and I uh, and the team at Three Hammers will, will be uh, more than happy to, uh, to help you with that. Uh, it'd be great to uh, let, uh, let us know your thoughts uh, on, on this lockdown episode and, uh, and, the, and the series so far as well. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, th I think as well, just, just from, from recent times as well, now we're the season literally, uh, spring is in the air, we're getting so much closer. Um, if People are asking me what to prioritize with now. I'd say, let's, you know, when we get out there, I can guarantee you, you're going to miss some greens. You're going to miss some greens. Uh, let's, let's, get, let's get the wedges out. Let's get the putter out. I've lost count how many putting lessons I've done and how many living rooms and hallways I've seen uh, online over the, these last couple of weeks. So, which I've got to say is, is, being, is being great because I know that once we get back to it, we wouldn't have been making those, uh, those fundamental putting changes. Uh, but now as we're moving closer, I want to get it more competitive, certainly for uh, for my players. I think that's that, that's a big thing. So get it competitive there. Be competitive with yourself. Loads of stuff that we can uh, we can do at uh, at home in the uh, in the gardens. Um, we'll be posting some videos. We already have posted a whole lot of uh, videos on uh, on social media um, and our YouTube channels on putting games, chipping games. Uh, the information that we provide today in the scoring sheets will be uh, will be uploaded as well, and we'll post that out. So um, yeah. Steve, thanks so much for uh, for your input. There, it's great to uh, great to great to chat with you. It's been a while, isn't it? So, yeah, great. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for your time. And uh, yeah, hopefully it's helped a couple of people. And uh, I'd actually like to, uh, if uh, if someone could, if they if they've got some games that they're using, share it with us. And uh, it's always good to to have some new new games to share with people and uh, and learn from as well. Yeah, ab absolutely. And uh, you know, we need to add to that library. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm forever uh, again, uh, forever asking students to uh, to come up with uh, with with their own games. Uh, I've actually seen quite a cool one actually with the just thinking back there with the when you said that with the chipping channels, mm -hmm. you know, with the uh, the landing areas there, we use a dice, yeah, and so kind of roll the dice, see what number that's channel you're going to aim at, and uh, so many so many cool things out there that we can uh, that, that that we can do. Absolutely, you could you could turn it into like a hopscotch kind of thing, couldn't you? you know? You roll that. You you, you roll. You've got to throw it, and then you've got to do every zone but that. Or you know, you can do so many things. Yeah, but above all, keep it uh, keep it fun. You know, keep it uh, keep keep it fun. Twenty twenty one. You know, hopefully it's going to be uh, going to be a fantastic season for us all. Uh, hopefully we're going to have some decent weather as well. Uh, make up for lost time. Um, Steve, thanks so much for uh, for your time today. Sure. Looking forward to sharing a bay. Won't be long. Yeah, yeah. Our new bay. It'll be brilliant. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we've uh, got a whole new look in the teaching area at the at the Three Hammers. So yeah, can't wait to share, to uh, to show that off uh, to everybody. So um, thanks, guys. Hope you enjoyed this episode of Lockdown Learning. Please let us uh, know your thoughts and your comments and uh, your skills games. And we wish you all the very best and look forward to uh, seeing you really soon. Thank you.